Hi everyone! This is my second to last video, which is kind of crazy that the semester is coming to an end so fast. But I just wanted to chat with you really quick about chapter 16 before I get into the content because I've been getting a lot of questions on it. So the learning objectives are technically one and four, not one through four, but I just wanted to go over what specifically you should know. And I'll go over in the video, but I wanted to go over ahead of time too. So you should know three different types of cash flows. So cash flows from operating activities, cash flows from investing activities, and cash flows from financing activities. And then you should know both the direct and indirect method for calculating cash flows from operating activities. And the middle two learning objectives, two and three, go over the indirect method and stuff like that in a lot more detail, but you need to know it at a very kind of basic level. And I'll go into it more in the video of like how much you should know, but I just wanted to clarify that because people were asking. And then finally, you should know free cash flow, but we'll also go over that again in chapter 17. So just wanted to update you on all of that. I think that's all I have to say, so let's get started. Chapter 16 is the Statement of Cash Flows. The Statement of Cash Flows reports a company's cash inflows and outflows for a period, and it's the statement we've kind of neglected so far as we've focused on the income statement and balance sheet, but we're going to focus on it now. So the statement of cash flows provides information about a company's ability to generate cash from operations, maintain and expand its operating capacity, meet its financial obligations, pay dividends, and a lot more. And it's really important for investors to look at. In the past, such as uh, during the early 2000s when we had uh, the collapse of Enron and other huge bankruptcies, investors weren't really looking at the statement of cash flows, but if they had been, they would have seen a lot of serious underlying issues. So Enron, for example, was one company, it was at one time the biggest bankruptcy um, in American history, uh, but it was later followed by larger ones. But Enron was recording really high revenue but if you looked into their cash flows, they didn't have any cash and their cash position was really, uh, really problematic because they were recording revenue when they signed contracts, but they weren't receiving the cash for it. So if you'd looked at the statement of cash flows, you would have seen that. So that's one of the reasons that it's very important. The statement of cash flows reports three types of cash flow activities. The first is cash flows from operating activities. And cash flows from operating activities are those that affect the net income of the company. So anything that happens in their daily operations, uh, which leads to net income. And we'll go over that in a little bit. The next kind is cash flows from or used for investing activities. And these are cash flows that were received from or used for transactions that affect investments in the non-current assets of a company. So it's exactly what it sounds for, anything having to do with investments. And the third kind is cash flows from or used for financing activities. So these are cash flows received from or used for transactions that affect the debt and equity of a company. Okay, so what is involved in each? For operating activities, a cash inflow would be something like the sale of products or services. So obviously when we sell products or services, that is an inflow of cash. We're making uh, revenue and we eventually receive cash for it. Outflows could be things like the purchase of inventory, paying employees, anything that represents either an expense. Purchase of inventory is an increase in assets, but we'll go over that later. But this one is pretty intuitive. Inflows would be anything we receive money for, for our daily operations. Outflows would be anything we have to pay money for in our daily operations. Investing activities. Inflows would represent things like the sale of property, plant, and equipment, or the sale of investments, because when we're selling it, we're getting rid of it, but we're receiving cash for it. And then outflows would be buying property, plant, and equipment, or purchasing investments, because we are paying for them, it represents a cash outflow. Financing activities um, is a little bit more involved. 
inflows would be things like issuing long-term liabilities or issuing stock because in both of these cases we are receiving cash for it so if you think of stock which you're now familiar with after chapter 13 whenever the company issues stock they're receiving cash and they're giving investors shares in exchange same thing with a long-term liability if you are issuing debt you are receiving cash for it now and then you are promising to repay it in the future Outflows could be things like paying dividends, which again from chapter 13, we know is a direct payment uh, often in cash uh, to investors, so that's an outflow. It could also be a repurchase of common stock, so you also know about treasury stock. That is the company purchasing stock, so cash outflow and then buying the stock back. So we're going to focus on cash flows from operating activities. And there are two methods for uh, determining cash flows from operating activities. The first is the direct method. And exactly what it sounds like, it directly reports cash receipts and cash payments. So the issue is that this data may not be readily available in the accounting records, so it's not used frequently in practice. And I'll explain what that means. So this right here is what it would look like. It would say cash flows from operating activities and you would take cash received from customers, so that's anything that you are paid, and that is one huge sum, likely what you got in revenue, and then you just subtract everything else that's an outflow. So you would subtract cash payments for merchandise, cash payments for operating expenses, cash payments for interest, cash payments for income taxes, and any other things you had, and then you would get net cash flow from operating activities. But the issue here is that we have a lot of receivables, and payables, and all sorts of things that aren't paid directly in cash. So, for example, your customer might not pay you in cash right away. They might pay buy something on account, so you would get an accounts receivable, and that's not um, in cash right away. Eventually, eventually you'll get cash, but um, when it's time to report this data, you might not have the cash figures yet. Same thing with payables. You might um, acquire something on account as a company so you get something but you have an IOU um, kind of payable outstanding so you haven't paid the cash for whatever you bought yet. So the presence of receivables and payables and other things like that really complicates the direct method. So because of that, like I said, it's not used frequently in practice. Instead, you use what's called the indirect method. And the indirect method reports cash flows from operating activities by beginning with net income. So we begin with net income and then we adjust for revenues and expenses not involving cash. So that kind of goes with what I was saying just a bit before. There are a lot of things that don't involve cash right away and we couldn't account for that with the direct method. So for that reason, we use the indirect method and it is used commonly in practice. And in fact, you'll see... Uh, in later courses, when you're calculating things like um, unlevered free cash flow and stuff like that, you'll use the theories uh, that I'm going to tell you about here. So how do we calculate cash flows from operating activities using the indirect method? It's a little bit complicated. I would recommend either just memorizing it outright, so this whole bit here that I'm going to go over, or um, I'm going to explain it a little bit. You can read it further in the textbook, or you can ask me questions about it whenever you'd like. Uh, you can look at it in Exhibit 5 in Chapter 16. But basically the process is you start with net income, like we said. So that's the first step. Then you are going to add depreciation, amortization, and other expenses not affecting cash. So you add back what are called non-cash expenses. So we know depreciation is the allocation of... Um, and assets like useful life over time, uh, but that's not actually happening. It's not directly involving cash. We just um, allocate it to an expense over time, but it's not an actual cash expense, so it's not decreasing our cash position. So we're going to add it back to net income because depreciation expense is an expense that's taken out of net income. We are going to add it back because we're finding the cash position and depreciation is non-cash. Same thing with amortization, and then same thing with any other expenses not affecting cash. So you add back all of those. You're going to add back losses on the disposal of assets, 
which same thing, it's not an actual cash loss, so we are adding it back. And then the two most important parts here that people tend to mix up or forget, you are going to add decreases in assets and you are going to add increases in liabilities. So I'll go over that whole thing in a second about decreases in assets and increase in liabilities. Um, but that is all you would do for adding. And then the third step is deducting. So you deduct gains on the disposal of assets because that, again, is basically um, an increase that is non-cash. So we do the opposite. We deduct a gain and then we deduct increases in assets and we deduct decreases in liabilities. So the two most complicated things are what's happening with assets and what's happening with liabilities. So I'll go over it briefly. Again, you could also just memorize this outright exactly up to you. Um, an easy trick if you're memorizing is that what's happening with assets is the opposite sign. And what's happening with liabilities is the same sign. So for assets, um, we add a decrease and we deduct an increase. For liabilities, we add an increase and we deduct a decrease. So this is plus minus and minus plus. This is plus plus and minus minus. And then what's happening uh, and why are we doing that? Let's take two different examples. First, let's say um, we're dealing with, well, let's do increases for both. So an increase in an asset. If an asset is increasing, let's say it's inventory increasing, you are paying for that inventory in order to um, add it to your assets and have it as an asset. And you're paying in cash. So it's a cash outflow in order to uh, represent an increase in that asset. So that is why cash is decreasing when we increase an asset. So if we use that inventory as an example, an increase in inventory, because we have to buy inventory, represents a decrease in cash. So an increase in an asset represents a decrease uh, in cash. So that's why we would deduct it. And then on the other hand, an increase in a liability, let's take accounts payable as an example. If you are um, buying something on an account and you're not paying for it in cash, you are um, there's an accounts payable and that would be increasing. The reason that it increases is because you're not paying for it right now, so there is no outflow of cash. You're saving money and you're holding on to money by uh, buying something on account and having a liability outstanding. So an increase in a liability represents an increase in cash for you. Um, I'd be happy to go over it in more detail with you if you'd like. I wanted to keep it relatively simple here um, uh, because it's not going to be tested super heavily. Like I said, uh, one more time, you can just memorize it if you want, but I'd be happy to go over it with you further if you'd like. Okay, format of the statement of cash flows. This is not super important, just uh, so you're familiar with it. You would have first uh, your cash flows from operating activities, your cash flows from investing activities, and your cash flows from financing activities. You would get, this is a simplified version, you would get your increase or decrease in cash. You have your cash at the beginning of the period, and then in order to get your cash at the end of the period, you would take the cash at the beginning of the period um, plus the increase in cash or minus the decrease in cash and get your cash at the end of the period. And then down at the bottom, you have just um, some other non-cash investing and financing activities and Frank might go over that with you. Okay, and then free cash flow. Free cash flow measures the operating cash flow available to a company after it purchases the property, plant, and equipment necessary to maintain its current operations. And it's a very valuable tool to use and look at. So this is the formula for it here. Free cash flow is cash flows from operating activities 
minus cash used to purchase PP&E. And that's um, uh, the formula. It's as simple as that. And you might be wondering, like, what does that tell us? So a positive free cash flow is considered favorable because a company has the ability to do a lot of things. Basically, it gives them financial flexibility. So a company with a really high free cash flow could fund growth and acquisitions. It could retire debt, uh, pay off debt. It could repurchase treasury stock. It could pay dividends, assuming it meets the other necessary requirements for dividends. Um, and companies with a negative free cash flow or just low free, free cash flow in general lack financial flexibility. So you really want to have cash on hand. Cash is king. You might have heard that expression because you can do a lot with it and it gives you flexibility. So that's why it's very important to look at and it's a good metric um, to look at. Okay, that covers the content. There's not a lot going on in uh, chapter 16, but it's important nonetheless. So practice problems. First, which of the following should be added to net income in calculating net cash flow from operating activities using the indirect method? So we're using the indirect method. This is where it would come in handy for you to know what we add and what we subtract and how we calculate um, operating cash flows using the indirect method. So we know we start with net income, and then it's asking us uh, what would we add. So we know we add back depreciation, amortization, non-cash expenses, we add back losses on the disposal of assets, we add back um, decreases in assets, and we add increases in liabilities. So the answer here is A, um, an increase in accrued liabilities. The others don't work because uh, B says a decrease in accounts payable, so we know that it's same signs for liabilities, so we add an increase in liabilities. We would have subtracted a decrease in liabilities, so a decrease in account accounts payable would be uh, subtracted. A gain on the sale of land, we know we do the opposite with those, so we add losses and subtract gains. And then dividends paid on common stock. Obviously, dividends we know are an outflow of cash, so that would not be added to net income. So the answer is A, an increase in accrued liabilities. Okay, the following information is available from the current period financial statements. And it's asking us for the net cash flow from operating activities using the indirect method. So again, we are going to start with net income. And net income is $200,000. Then we know we add back depreciation and other non-cash expenses. So we are going to add the $45,000 depreciation expense. Then we have to think about what we do with assets and liabilities. So what we have here is an increase in rec accounts receivable. Accounts receivable is an asset. We know assets use the opposite sign. So an increase in accounts receivable is going to be a deduction. So we are going to subtract $12,000 there. And then fourth, it tells us a decrease in accounts payable. So accounts payable is a liability. We know that's the same sign. So a decrease in accounts payable is going to be a deduction of 17000 And in total, that gets us 216000 for cash flows from operating activities. Okay, and last one. This one's pretty easy. Cash paid for equipment would be reported on the statement of cash flows in and it would be cash flows from investing activities because that is um, PP and E and it's as simple as that. It's not operating activities, it's not financing activities, the, that is an investment and it wouldn't be in a separate section. Okay, if you have any questions on chapter 16, please feel free to reach out and I hope you have a great rest of your day.